I'm going to play He Touched Me. And I said, well, I'm quite sure that you could have written that if somebody hadn't done it first. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Ephesians chapter 2. Just remind you what we're doing in these days, this season, where when October 31st rolls around, uh, it will mark the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's nailing of 95 points of contention or concern on the door of the church at Wittenberg, Germany, which sparked, uh, he had no intention of doing this, it sparked what we know today to be the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. And so what we determined to do with this being the 500th anniversary was to wrap our minds around uh, that incredible event that God used. Spurgeon described it as the as the gospel or the scriptures were singing sweetly in the dungeon uh, and God sent someone to throw the door open, a monk named Martin Luther, and set them free from the bondage that they had undertaken by the, uh, by the Roman Catholic Church in, in those medieval times. What we've been doing, if you just recall, uh, on Sunday evenings we are watching a brief video, 10, 15 minutes or so, maybe 18 minutes, uh, by three very renowned scholars discussing the five solas of the Reformation. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone, uh, Sola Gratia, Grace alone, we're looking at today, Sola Fide, Faith alone, uh, Solus Christus, Christ alone, Soli Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. They're taking these one at a time, introducing a six-session series uh, Five Truths That Shape the Christian Life. And so we've kind of jumped onto that, showing that video on Sunday night. And then the following Sunday morning, preaching on the topic discussed in the video. So they began with the question, why study the Reformation? And on October the 1st, I preached on that. Why does the Reformation matter today, 500 years later? We suggested to you that it's because we live in a culture in the West that some have described postmodern. You remember what postmodern means? It's the deconstruction of words, uh, where you can make a word mean anything you want. You're seeing that on the political horizon today. We suggested you we need to recover the gospel uh, that we are not only postmodern but we are pre-Reformation. We're, we're living in times in the West. Our primary concern in the West is the United States of America, where we live, where there's, there is incredible, stygian, spiritual darkness. When you read polls that come out that say what, what church-going, professing Christians believe, it is shocking. The percentage that believe in reincarnation, that believe that, that the Bible is a good book, but so is the Quran. On and on, I could tell you, that it would just make your heart sink. We live in postmodern, pre Reformation, middle aged darkness in 2017. So we need a recovery again of the gospel. I've had the privilege of being a part of something that was launched in 1983 called Founders Ministries, which exists to reform local churches and recover the gospel. We need that today. We looked next at sola scriptura, scripture alone. And we pointed out to you then there's a difference. It's subtle, but it's real between sola scriptura and solo scriptura. Sola scriptura meaning that the Bible is our ultimate authority. Any authority in your life or my life that I assert must be checked by the scriptures and where it disagrees with the scriptures it must be abandoned but we do not have the attitude solo scriptura that just me and my bible i don't need anybody else jesus christ loved the church he died for the church 
Vance Havner said in one of his sermons, an old uh, Southern Baptist evangelist was a great preacher. Uh, he's gone to be with the Lord now. He said, I believe in the universal, no, he said, I believe in the invisible church, but not that view of the invisible church that makes you invisible at church. No, we, we need one another. We need to be iron sharpening iron. We need to read those writings of great men and women gone by. We stand on the shoulders of giants. That's been said in one of the videos. So sola scriptura is our ultimate authority. How do you know what you know? Why do you believe what you believe? Why do you think what you think? Better slide it under the microscope of scripture. And if scripture finds it wanting, then toss it. If it lines up with scripture, then hug it tight as you can. Go forward with it. And so today, sola gratia. And you'll hear some people, in fact, the video last Sunday evening, one of the men said uh, sola gratia, and that's, that's okay. Sola gratia, grace alone. Ephesians chapter 2, that's where I want us to go today. Turn there in your Bibles. Stand with me if you will. We're going to read verses 8, 9, and 10. We will, we will expand going backward around to verse 1 and following. Verses 8, 9, and 10. You know these. Many of you could quote this. This is a, this is a pivotal passage that tells us how we are saved and how we are not saved. Follow along as I read this. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. And while... I have no doubt that everyone in here believes in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We need to be sure that we're not letting anything insidiously slide into that, be added to that. That we stand in this amazing grace. We live by a grace of God that's greater than all of our sins. It's one of the bases we have to have a biblical assurance that we belong to Jesus and he belongs to us. Thank you. Please be seated. Sola gratia. It's grace alone. So doctrine that holds that salvation from its inception to its conclusion is a work of the free grace of God. Grace is best defined as God's unmerited favor shown to undeserving sinners. Every now and then you'll talk to somebody that they, they've decided somehow that, that God's not fair, that he ought to give everybody a chance, and if he doesn't give everybody a chance, there's something wrong with this God. In other words, how could a God, how could a loving God send people to hell in deepest, darkest Africa, and we could actually say that in deepest, darkest America. Uh, but the question needs to be asked. We ask our children in the, in the early portions of the catechism, what does every sin deserve? The children will tell you the anger and judgment of God. According to the scripture, to whom, to which son of Adam, which daughter of Eve, does God owe salvation? One pastor said, it's a zero and you take the, take the circle out of the middle. To none. Now, folks, we've got to be convinced of this. If we can make a case that he owes salvation to any, and Paul says we have moved away from grace if we're talking about obligation. If I step down from here now, and I could cause a real uproar if I whipped out some sticks of gum, started passing them around, I handed them to some and didn't hand them to others. Would that be unfair? I see the modern society says, well, now if you've got to give it to some, you've got to give it to all. Really? Did I owe it to the people I gave it to? No. Did I owe it to the people I didn't give it to? No. 
our thinking has been messed up in America. And if we'll, if we'll hear the scripture, it'll fix it. <laughs> but it's got to be, the scripture's got to be sola scriptura to us. It's got to be our authority, our ultimate authority. Not what I feel. I read today that in, I think it's in Mississippi, I'm not sure, in some public school, that To Kill a Mockingbird has been taken out of the library. Because some people didn't feel good about it. Let me tell you something about that, this mentality that seems to be sweeping our culture. The Bible says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can, who can know it? You can't trust your heart. I don't care what Reba uh, McIntyre says. The heart don't lie. That's all the heart does is lie until it's saved by grace. So when we talk about grace, we're talking about something God does, unmerited and earned it, to undeserve it. 65 years old, and say about 45 years now, I'm still astounded that he would save me. I was just a generation removed from full-blown Islam. My paternal grandfather came to this country from Syria. I was raised by a man who was one of the most clever, sneaky, Southern Baptist hypocrites you've ever met. And God saved me by his grace. My mentor, R.F. Gates, said to me one time, Bill, he said, pray that you never wake up in a morning when you've gotten over being saved. Pray that God takes you during the night before you wake up and yawn at the idea of grace. And I would say to you that I think too many people in the West who confess to be Christians seem to have gotten over the grace of God. Martin Luther grew up in a spiritual climate that taught salvation came by the grace of God mixed with the meritorious works of the sinner. So, sometimes I'm reading this week, and sometimes you'll hear this, and, and this fellow was, was quick to check it. And people say, well, you know, we believe in salvation by grace. Catholics believe in salvation by works. That is not true. That's not, that's not a fair assessment of Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism believes in salvation by grace mixed with works. But they see grace in some. They see grace in the shed blood of Christ. But they see grace in the wafer taken at mass. They see grace in the in the juice consumed by the priest at mass. They see grace in going to the confessional booth. In other words, it's things that we do. It's, it's, so they so they've redefined grace. One fellow said one time. He said they use our vocabulary but not our dictionary assign different terms to it so it's not fair to say that Roman Catholics don't believe in grace they just have uh, redefined it and if you're familiar you've heard this seen it in some of the videos perhaps uh, there's a great movie by the way called Luther uh, I think Ralph Fiennes may be the may be the lead actor and I've encouraged you to rent it if you, if you get access to it it's a pretty, pretty accurate depiction of, of Luther's day um, one of the things that set Luther off was Johann Tetzel. You heard that name, Tetzel? Johann Tetzel. I mentioned it before. He was assigned by the Pope and others as well, but he seemed to be the, he was the one in Luther's area, he seemed to sell indulgences to help people get themselves and or their loved ones out of purgatory and, and on the way to heaven more quickly. And I think I told you last week, uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I don't remember if we talked about this on Sunday night. <laughs> and I'm repeating. So there will be some repetition. If you were here last Sunday night, you said, well, you already said that. Then I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm going to be like S.M. Lockridge, the, the black preacher in uh, Los Angeles. When, a woman came to him and they said, preacher, you preached on that before. 
He said, I sure did. And I'm going to keep on preaching on it until you start living it. So just, it's, Peter says, I'm not, I'm not burdened to remind you to say things you have done before, but also understand that I may have said it already. And, and if, if I've forgotten that I've said it, then you just act like it's the first time you've heard it. Say, wow, that's wonderful. Okay, then just humor me. Tetzel would say, as soon as the coin, he's going, he's going to be selling indulgence, give me some money. As soon as the coin in the coffer clings, the soul up from purgatory springs. That was the, this, is, this set Luther and the reformers off. The notion that you could buy the favor of God. Luther said this, it's true. I was a good monk and kept my order so strictly that I could say if ever a monk could get to heaven through monastic discipline, I should have entered in. All my companions in the monastery who knew me would bear me out in this. For if I'd gone on much longer, I would have martyred myself to death with what with vigils, prayers, readings, and other works. And yet my conscience would not give me certainty. But I always doubted and said, you didn't do that right. You weren't contrite enough. You left that out of your confession. The more I tried to remedy an uncertain, weak, and troubled conscience with human traditions, the more daily I found it more uncertain, weaker, and more troubled. I think I told you, one time he climbed the steps to St. Peter's Basilica. One of the, was one of the things you could do to, to merit grace. And at every step, and I forget how, how many there are, he would stop and kiss the step, confess something, and go the next step until he got to the top. He got to the top and he stood up and he said, oh, I'm forgiven. What am I? He would go to his father confessor, von Staupitz, who was there to hear the confession of his, of his monks, these Augustine monks. And finally, von Staupitz got fed up and said, Luther, go out and commit some sin worthy of coming to confession with. He was, he was confessing everything. I had an idle thought. I had a wandering thought when I was, and von Stauffen just got, had enough. You're driving me crazy. That's the climate here. Now think about this. This was a very conscientious monk, but that was the climate he was being raised in. Think about the common person, the person who didn't have access to read the scriptures, who did not, uh, can afford a lifestyle which allowed him to be in prayer during the day. It was a terrible time. And when the reformers saw the papacy taking advantage of the people and holding them in bondage to indulgences and purgatory, and they had enough. Our text, look at our text. For by grace you've been saved through faith. Someone has pointed out, I thought this was pretty that when you read through this, by grace, sola gratia, pops up. You've been saved through faith, sola fide, comes up. And this not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, sola, solus Christus. For good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This, this whole thing, Soli Deo Gloria. It's all about God. And it's found in Ephesians. Sola Scriptura. We sing these hymns, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. We didn't sing this other one this morning. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? We love to sing of the saving grace of God, and rightly so. John said in his gospel, in chapter 1, verse 16, speaking of Jesus, for from him, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ here today, if you've been saved, I mean really saved, any time at all, you can look at your life and say, so, you know, that's what it's been. Grace piled on top of grace. Many of the New Testament letters, if you, if you read them, they begin with, with what we call an epistolary introduction. It's to made the, the 
grace of God. The grace of God our Father. The Lord this, this commending, this incredible work of God. In fact, the very last words of the New Testament, Revelation 22, 21, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. It was one of the hallmarks. It was, it was one of the realities that, that the Reformers discovered in the Scriptures that set the papacy at total odds with the Scriptures. Because you see, the papacy used the idea of grace to keep the people under control. It could dispense grace. It could withhold grace. By the way, that's, cults today do the same thing. Cults c- convince people that they can, they can dispense the favor of God or deity, whatever the deity is, or they can withhold the favor. And, and that's how the leaders control the people. And Luther had been set free. When the light of the glory of God, we'll look at this next week in Sola Fide, dawned upon him that the just shall live by faith. And he realized the righteousness that God requires of us, he provides in Christ. Luther was growing up under a system of infused righteousness, and yet he discovered the scripture was teaching imputed righteousness, the righteousness of another. We'll we'll look at that tonight and delve into it next Sunday morning. It was by grace. And the papacy was threatened because they knew that if the people became convinced that they did not need the church to dispense grace, they would be finished with the church. So Luther not only opposed the prevailing doctrines of the day, not only cast aspersion upon the significance of the pope, he struck at the very foundation of Roman Catholicism. And if we will hear his words today and hear the teaching of Scripture today, we will strike at the very foundation of any pharisaical system that sets up works as a way to earn favor with God. And we can be helped to slay the Pharisee that is in every one of us. So grace alone, sola gratia, came to the forefront. Salvation is the sovereign gift of God. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. When when the scripture says in Romans that he, he gave this freely, the word there is without cause, without, without an initiating cause in me. One of the old hymns. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless come to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain. That fountain filled with blood. Foul I to the fountain fly, that is, I run. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Not what my hands have done. So you think about the marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. We'll look at that In a couple of weeks, solace, Christus, grace, grace, God's grace. Not God's grace mixed with my works. Not God's grace that he found in me. A popular, he's not popular anymore, but a popular Bible teacher, I heard him teach one time that when the passage we read in Titus 2, that the grace of God's appeared to all men. He said, he, I heard him say it, and I almost came up out of my chair. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared in all men. In. That's not what the scripture teaches. 
And he said, that means that all of us have grace. And God will hold us accountable for whether or not we use the grace that all of us have. Twisted. All of us need grace. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Why do you boast as if it's yours uh, natively, instinctively, intrinsically? Paul asks this in Romans 11, 35, when when he is considering this, this amazing multitude of mercy. Who has given a gift to him, that is to God, that he might be repaid, that God would owe him? But Ephesians 2, 1 to 10 is one of the most fascinating passages because it tells us what we are by nature and how God stepped in. My, again, my, my mentor, R.F. Gates, had in his office, and I didn't get this when he died. We, it was offered to me, but I gave it to his oldest son. Plaque. It said, but God. Dot, dot, dot. Look at Ephesians 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Notice how Paul mixes his metaphors. You were dead, and and being dead in trespasses and sins means that that was the tenor of your life. That's how you lived. Following the course of this world. One of our enemies, the world. Following the prince of the power of the air. Another one of our enemies, the devil. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Another enemy, the flesh. We have threefold enemy, you know. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Paul acknowledges this here. Among whom, and Paul says, I'm not not talking ill of you, among whom we all once lived. Folks, we came that way. I know, I know. When your babies were born, they were the most precious little things in the world. There'd never been a baby prettier than them and cuter than them and more cuddly than them and on and on. And and then we really lose it when we become grandparents. I mean, it's like, you know, my my, my kids look at me sometimes and say, where are the parents that raised us? Well, you're carrying on over these grandkids. Well, I tell them, I don't have to raise them, so I can do a lot of things that I wouldn't have thought about doing with you, but that's another discussion of the day. Uh, But they were born sinners. Precious little bundles of depravity. Dead dead and trespassing in a sense. We've got to see them that way. We all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. By the way, did you see this week that the Department of Health and Human Services has declared that life begins at conception. It is the most pro-life statement ever to come from our government making statements about life. By nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. You know, you hear the question sometimes, well, are we sinners because we sin, or do we sin because we're sinners? Well, both of those things are true, but the originating factor is we sin because we're sinners. We're right here. We're born, dead in trespass and sins. We're born children of wrath, and we simply work it out. I've told you this probably a hundred times since I've been your pastor, but I'll just remind you, I never had to teach a one of my children to disobey me. I never got ready to go to grandma's and say, okay, come here, come here, come here. Okay, let's, I'm, I got a bunch of stuff on the coffee table here now. I want you to pull up. I want you just to swipe everything off the coffee table. Do it. I never had to do that. Never had to. I go bounding in to see my mom. Seven hour drive. My firstborn, who's not here, but his offspring are. Pulling himself up. so proud. He's pulling himself up. Isn't that wonderful? He's going to be walking soon. Pulls himself up at that little coffee table. I said, no. 
No. I won't tell you how old he was because you'll get mad at me. I took, I took his hand. And pop, right on there. Don't turn me in. He's 40 now. So it's another. He hadn't written any books about me yet. I'm thankful for that. So he looked at me. Pop, got all upset. Mama comes rushing. In, oh, no. No, no. I'll just move everything. I said, no, you're not going to move everything. It clearly goes here because when we walked in the room, that's where it was. So I put it back up. No. Knocked it up. So we did this several times until he discovered, I think Daddy's serious about this. And he stopped. I never had to teach him. Never had to teach him that. Why? Children of wrath by nature. But look here. Verse 4. This is shouting ground. That's, that's who we are, by the way. Dead trespasses and sins, living like the world, without a care for God, pursuing passions, carrying out desires, by nature children of wrath, children deserving the wrath of God, if he acts right then and there. But God, being rich in mercy, his mercy is his, is his heart of pity. He looks with pity upon helpless humanity. Being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Now, even when we were dead in our trespasses, Paul says this in Romans 5, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for the ungodly. Made us alive together with God. Now watch, I want to see what Paul's doing here. Paul's going somewhere, but he cannot hold it back. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. He can't hold it back. He's not even ready to talk about it. He's not ready to write what he's going to write in verses 8, 9, and 10. By grace, you've been saved. Raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Someone said, well, what motivated him? His mercy or his grace? The biblical answer is yes. His love of pity. To show his love for guilty, undeserving sinners. He looked upon your plight and my plight and he pitied where we were. Because we were not coming out of that mess on our own. Why? Verse 7. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness. Notice, toward us in Christ Jesus. He showed us the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness. He could have shown us how much grace he has and withheld it from us, and that would have been fair. That would have been righteous. But he shows us the immeasurable riches of his grace in in a kind way. He takes his only son, his darling son, the darling of heaven, and he offers him up in our place. Not because, I've heard people say, well, if you'd have been the only person in the world, God would have sent Jesus to save you. Well, you know something? It, it, that'd be pretty lonely to be the only person in the world, but. Uh, if, if he was showing grace, it's said as if God so wanted to save people that he, he'd just come to save one if he could do it. That misses the point. It's a world of sinners that he sent Jesus to save. And he offered him up because you couldn't atone for your sin. And I couldn't atone for my sin. People say something, well, I just want what's coming to me. I do not want what's coming to me, people. If I got what was coming to me, I should have been thrown into hell the moment I breathed this earth's atmosphere as a newborn baby. Anything short of that, understand this, is mercy. September 14, 1952, I get through the day breathing. I was, I was a little bitty thing, by the way. I don't know I told you. I weighed four pounds, 15 ounces when I was born. 
I've made up for it. But I started out really, really tiny. My mother put me in a little box when she would go out and sell an Avon. Just a little Avon box. September 15th, I lived. Well, you know the rest of the story because I'm standing right here. The point is that I did not get cast into hell like I deserved. I did not get what was coming to me. I got grace because Jesus Christ got what was coming to me. That's what Paul's saying here. And that's it. He launches into this text. I want, you, I want to give you this. We talked about it last Sunday night. I want to give you the flow of this in the, in the words, that are the, the verbal terms here. For by grace you have been saved and continue to stand in a saving relationship. That's the force of that verb. Something that's happened in the past that has continuing and abiding results. Perfect passage. By grace you have been saved and continue standing in a saving relationship, and it's through faith. I told the folks last Sunday, and I told you this when we went through Ephesians years ago, if you diagram this passage, you get awfully excited. By grace, I know Georgia here is an English teacher, extraordinaire. By grace, through faith, saved. By grace, saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. And the law of antecedent says you've got to find out what, what does that go to? What are you talking about? Well, when you look at the diagram, that by grace saved faith. That, the faith is the most, is the closest term to the antecedent. So, that. So faith is not of yourself. Well, it says that. It's a gift of God. But it's bigger than that. Salvation is not of yourself. God's idea. Grace. So it's talking about this whole, this whole package, this, this saving process that comes out of, the, out of the gracious mind of God. The grace is not yours originally. The salvation is not yours originally. The faith is not yours originally. It is the gift of God, the whole thing. Not of works. So it's not only, see, Martin Luther was raised in a setting that says, yes, Look what God's done in Christ. But you've got to do this. No. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 says, you don't. No, not of works. Paul says in Romans 9, so it's not of him who wills. It's God who shows mercy. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that what? so that there's no room for me to boast. There's no place for me to pray, well, Lord, I, I thank you that I'm not like this fellow over here. <laughs> I thank you that I'm so, I'm religious. I'm, I'm very religious, Lord. I go to church every Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You say, well, you're a preacher. I did that, folks, before I was a preacher. I did that all the way through seminary. I, all the way grown up. Yeah. I'm thankful I'm not like No, I'm no different from that person. Who made me to differ? If I have a heart for God at all, it's because God's grace came upon me. If I'm not out murdering people from the 32nd floor of a Las, Las Vegas hotel, because God has restraining grace upon me, checks my heart. It's grace. You've got to realize that. And think about what we would be without God's restraining influence, without him withholding, keeping me alive, keeping me uh, fairly sane, uh, keeping, protecting me from, from other influences until, until in the fullness of time. He saves me. Delivering me from, from the delusion of thinking that all my religiosity was pleasing God. Gripping me one day with the reality of Isaiah, your righteousness, all, your, all the stuff you do that cause people to pat you on the head and tell, tell your mama, Marzell, you must be really proud of him. All that is filthy rags to me. 
grace. Undeserved. Unmerited. Grace. Well, it's transforming grace. We talked about that last Sunday night. It's transforming grace. Jerry Bridges' book, I commend it to you. Transforming Grace. It'll take you, it'll grab you by the nap of the neck, it'll take you right to the edge of the cliff and hold you over the edge. About God's grace. It's good for you. It'll shake the Pharisee out of you. Four. And my, one of my professors in the seminary said, when you see four, you've got to ask yourself, what's it there for? When you see there for, you ask, what's it there for? Four. You see, we're not saved by works. But the salvation by grace through faith that comes to us in Jesus Christ by the application of the Holy Spirit is a salvation that fuels and funnels in us works. <laughs> we want to. I want to has been fixed. Before I was saved, I had a different want to. My want to has been fixed. For we are his workmanship. I told you this when we went through Ephesians. I won't belabor this. The, word, the Greek word is poema. We get our word poem from us. You and I constitute today an anthology of poems. If we're saved by grace through faith, you, your story tells a little differently than mine. Mine tells differently from yours. But woven through it is this thread of the grace of God. Grace, grace, God's grace. All the way through it. You're his workmanship. Created. He didn't just fix you. He didn't rearrange your your life. I, I think it's Kenny Rogers has a song, You Decorated My Life. No, Jesus didn't come and decorate our lives. He came and summoned us out of the, out of the grave. We sing that hymn, Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound by sin in nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose and then went and skipped through the tulips singing, isn't it wonderful to be saved? No, I rose, went forth and followed thee. Amazing love, how can it be? That thou, my God, would die for me. Grace does that to you. I love you. But I'm going to tell you something. If you're clinging to a grace today that hadn't transformed you, if you're clinging to a grace today that hadn't changed you, it's not grace. It's not God's grace. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. And God has prepared those before him too. Not saved by works. Saved to work. Works is not the root. It's the fruit. Grace is the root. Works is the fruit. Is that your life? You have a life that people look at you and the worst thing somebody can say to us is, well, I never thought you were a Christian. I got a One of my professors said to me in college, before the Lord saved me, there I was, 19 years old, had all those 100% attendance pins on my dresser, all those accolades ringing in my ear. Well, I never took you for a Christian, she said. It's the beginning of the undoing of me. And he broke in. Are you saved? By grace plus nothing? Being saved by grace plus nothing changes your life and makes you want to. Psalmist says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. A lot of people in the West say, they, oh, yeah, I guess they are me, but it's not a big deal. It's a, it's a change of want to. It's a heart thing. You want to. You want to bless God. You want to love others. You want to touch people. Somebody touched you. You want to touch them. Lynn played earlier. He touched me and made me whole. You've been made whole. You want, you want the Lord to help you extend your hand out and touch somebody for the glory of God and the sake of the gospel and in the name of Christ. And, you're a beggar who's found bread. You were starving to death and somebody handed you the bread of life, Jesus Christ, in an act of incredible grace and you took it and the Spirit made you hungry for it and you ate it and you said, oh, wonderful bread of life. And you walk around beggars all the time and nobody's offered them bread. 
Grace changes us. Grace changed us. It caused a monk to say, I'm done with religion. I'm done with this nonsense. I want to know Christ. I ask you today, have you been saved by this grace? If you have, there's a story that you can't get away from. If you haven't, it's not a crime, but it's a sin. And I invite you to trust in Jesus Christ today. Call out to him, Lord, have mercy. You don't need to go into a box, confess your sin to a man. Lord, have mercy right where you are. And he will come and show you mercy. And he'll show you grace. And he'll change you. You won't be the same again. You won't be the same again. Sola. Gratia. Let's pray.